All right. Hello, everyone. We're here to talk about DAOs today, the rise of DAOs. So a DAO is, stands for a Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And my panel today is illustrious leaders in this space who are leading us towards the future of decentralized organizations. So I'd like to give everybody a chance to introduce themselves. Why don't we start with, uh, we have an academic here with us. So Dr. Nick. I used to be an academic. <laughs> I, uh, I escaped into crypto 18 months ago now, around that. So yeah, my name's Nick. Um, I'm a protocol leader, I call myself, um, for a network called finance.vote. And we're kind of trying to make the Google Apps ecosystem for DAOs. So we've got like six different DApps that form the component pieces for decentralized organizations. And you can do lots of different types of DAOs with us. And it's our goal to just kind of incubate and launch DAOs um, by the hundreds in the future, hopefully. By the hundreds. Thank you. Ben. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm, I'm more of a DAO participant from API3. Uh, we're a first party Oracle solution, and uh, yeah, we're providing the data needed for, for Web3 to be built in effect. Um, the DAO really is a, 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 an attempt at further decentralizing that infrastructure play, and um, yeah, I, I work in more of the growth capacity within the DAO day to day. Thanks, Ben. Uzair. Hi, everyone. My name is Uzair, and we recently launched a DAO to govern a decentralized exchange by the name of Symmetric, which is essentially a mobile-first decentralized exchange. And it's, uh, it's been quite the experience to, to start a DAO and, and set it up. And Would you mind starting at the beginning? I think the mic wasn't on at the very beginning, but it's on now. So just say again what your project is doing. Yeah, um, so we... We represent a company called uh, Symmetric Finance, which started off as a decentralized exchange, but we've recently uh, launched a DAO for governance, and uh, we've, we've recently gone through all the things you need to sort of consider when decentralizing governance for, for uh, an exchange of that nature. Thank you, Uzair. And Chris? I'm uh, Chris Wilson from Rock Network. I don't think your mic is on. Can you guys hear him? No. <laughs> Try again. Hello? Oh. Hey. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Chris Wilson from, from Random Network. I mean, primarily we're a, an IoT um, service discovery and solu security solution that looks to sort of replace existing cloud infrastructure. Um, but we, we look at ethics and accountability a lot. Um, and we're, we're sort of striving to make things more, more open, and, and that's ultimately where the, the DAO comes into our product. Um, we, we're um, giving users a say about the way in which their data is sold off to companies, so allowing users to kind of vote um, on how the data from a 5G-enabled device in their homes is, is then sold off, and which companies it can actually be sold off to. Thank you. All right, so this is a fairly in-depth topic. Um, it is the future. I really believe that DAOs are the future. But let's try to deconstruct what is a DAO, what is a DAO actually, and what it, can it be used for now and in the future? Where are we with this whole space? And I would like to ask all of you, anyone can answer, what would you say is a DAO? I'll, I'll go first. Um, I actually give a different answer for this every time I'm asked for it. <laughs> so actually what it is is kind of undefined at the moment because it's moving so quickly. So the way to think about them is, is kind of digital coordination hubs. Um, it's a place, or it's, a, it's a kind of idea for how we can organize in the future. It uses blockchain technology. And essentially it's a, it was the original idea of Ethereum was that you could go and work online and be paid for it anywhere in the world. And it's that kind of idea that, that has turned into a, a kind of movement, if you like. Mm -hmm. The most common DAOs at the moment are DeFi DAOs, I would say. They hold large amounts of money. They're trustless. 
people vote on changes to smart contracts, but I would say they can be much more expressible than that. So they are places where people can collaborate and govern themselves using crypto assets. Very nice. I agree with you. It was the vision for Ethereum, and maybe it fell short, but this is iteration two. It's happening now, I think. It's, it's just taking some more time than we thought it was. Thank you. Great definition. Um, so what are the challenges in actually running a DAO today? I suppose just to return to, to Nick's point there, I mean, it, a DAO really is something that, that is undefined. And when you, you take a pro product like ours where you know, our team is ultimately focused on the, the core part of our solution and, and not necessarily the DAO as a whole, um, there, is a, there is sort of a, um, a gap um, both in the market and academic research uh, for, for some type of standard that defines uh, this stuff, like how to democratize decision making. I mean, ultimately, the, some of the original DAOs were based around token holdership or coin crypto asset owner ownership. And, and, and that, to me, is a return to sort of feudalism from the perspective of whoever has the most, has the most clout in that decision. So um, I think a big challenge is really standardizing this stuff and getting the word out about, about more efficient ways of, of making decision making and making it something where it is actually democratized and, and not just um, another unfair system in the world. Yes, agreed. Any other challenges, Ben? Yeah, I think I think just to build on that, the you know what Nick was saying is very true. We're at the start of of kind of these decentralized organisations emerging around what are different areas of of the digital asset space. Um, I think the practical side of the DAO is is like, the governance mechanisms are hindered by maybe gas fees. You know, it becomes tough for smaller maybe token holders to to play a role. Um, even though the idea is to be you know, community-led and community-governed, and also uh, as transparent as possible. So those, those two things are attainable and achievable, but I think there is a challenge at the moment to, to kind of getting you know, more distributed governance within, within a DAO, um, which I think there's solutions coming via L2s and, and solutions like Nick's infrastructure that he's building. So mm -hmm. that's uh, yeah, something I see. And Sarah, did you have a comment yeah. on the challenges? Yeah, I think um, most uh, decentralized structures, you know, they sit on a spectrum. So at one end you have DAOs which are completely decentralized and, and you achieve this level where, you know, uh, consensus essentially dictates what happens within the protocol. On the other side you have completely centralized structures. So I think most DAOs today sit somewhere in the middle and the challenge is how do we get to that other end of the spectrum where governance is truly democratic. And you know, as, as Ben mentioned, there's uh, uh, logistical challenges such as gas fees, but uh, in my opinion, and, and having someone who recently started a DAO, the other challenges you face is you really wanna give everyone an equal voice, um, but engagement is never equal from all DAO participants. So it's really trying to find that balance I think just a, another build on that as well is to engage the community in the right way, you need, it is a, you know, everyone knows community managers play a very important role in, in most projects, right? I think there is a huge amount of resource needed to communicate what is going on within the DAO, and there is a gap almost between the community and what they see within the DAO, maybe platforms or templates or what, what you communicate. So I think maybe a challenge is, uh, you know, scaling that comms platform, it's very resource heavy. Um, you know, that will drive participation within voting mechanisms and so on and so forth. But yeah, the amount of kind of resource that you need day to day to manage that function, I think is, is quite heavy in reality. I, I suppose as well, I mean, you could consider the sort of layer one infrastructure to be, to be a DAO in some respects. And, and there's, a, there's a, a lot of people out there who either, you know, don't have the, the funds to, to go ahead and purchase a, a, a GPU to run a node on a proof of work chain or some some ASICs miner or something like that. It's also um, a case where people don't really have the, the, the technical capability to do so. So, uh, you know, you're always going to get that. You, we're always going to be in that position with, with proof of work um, where, where people are just simply excluded from, from doing this, this sort of stuff. So 
um, part participation rates um, from from token holders having a vote is one thing, but another thing is we we sh we, we we need to start addressing on proof of work chains like Bitcoin some way of of giving people a say on that that infrastructure as well. Yeah, I agree. I think I agree. Bitcoin is a DAO. <coughs> it's just a very very hard decentralized DAO, and. Um, out from that, you can, your organization can get more complex, complex than just doing money. And the more complex you get, the more difficult it gets, because you then have to defeat coordination problems. And it's like setting up an organization where anyone can walk in off the street and start, to, you know, start being part of it. And that just changes the game completely to what a conventional organization would do. Uh, and, but still, you've got to convince them to come in off the street and start working, and that's actually the hardest bit. I agree with the kind of sentiment here that finding good people, even though you're an open platform mm -hmm. and anyone in the world can join, is actually exceptionally difficult. Mm -hmm. And in fact, 99% of the market are token flipping degens. So you've got all these guys who just want you to pump a token, they don't really want to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, so engagement, voting, voter apathy, these huge problems, but actually filtering out the people who actually want to take part. Um, and contribute productively is like probably the biggest challenge and um, yes engagement and building fair and fair and distribution <coughs> and paying people for their work mm -hmm. um, so the, the sort of dream is that you can make a load of people who participate in your organization get all the upside with you so and doing that fairly is one of the hardest things to do I think um, so generating engagement and then rewarding everyone fairly is probably the biggest pain point problem at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I just make a comment on that, which is that corporations tend to attract attract psychopaths. It's just it's just a fact because the way that a corporation is structured, anyone who is able to um, convince their boss, who's very charismatic and able to convince their boss that they're completely on their side and they're doing what needs to be done. Doesn't matter about the people under them, they can pay the price, but if they're able to manage up very well, they can rise in the organization. So it's a perfect opportunity for someone who is, you know, a psychopath, essentially. I can't find another word for it, to rise in an organization. And that's why you see so many um, people in big tech companies who are there for the land grab or the territory and they're guarding their territory. So what you said, what all of you have brought up is this idea that you can contribute to a DAO and be rewarded fairly. I don't think that structure is as attractive to that type of personality who is just trying to rise in the corporation. So then if it's not about your superior's recognizing your contribution, which we know can be corrupted, then how do you fairly <laughs> recognize people's contribution, the people who are actually doing the work? Mm. I think, I think the, if you look at the broader space, the, the Web3 space, it, it's an open source ethos, right? Everything being built is transparent, the community is, is all participating. I think when you look at uh, maybe combining that with centralized constructs and therefore closed source products or protocols even, um, you start to kind of see these two kind of ethoses and mindsets. And maybe the DAO is the, the, the open source organization. And maybe the, the closed source organization just has that different mentality. Um, and there's trades off to, I guess, both in some ways. But you know, I, I think over a longer period of time, the open source community will build better products and services for people. And that will eventually win, I think. Um, what the DAO's role in that, I think, is yeah, we're, we're, I think we're at the first few steps of what a DAO really is. Yeah. Um, we discussed this before, didn't we? The, the kind of the, the rules haven't been written. We're all learning, uh, and I think it's super interesting how this is all going to start to merge together. Um, yeah. I suppose that kind of goes back to like thinking about around the time when Steve Jobs passed away, and you had the death of Dennis Ritchie around the this, the same time. So obviously, um, you know, talked about a lot within the, the sort of engineering sector, but the wider general public, despite the fact that he was so, um, he, 
his work was so necessary for, for computing in general, mm -hmm. most people have not heard of that person. Um, mm -hmm. So even, even open source or not, a lot of people don't, probably don't know that Gavin Wood wrote a lot of the code base for Ethereum. That's something that's, that's ignored. People kind of look to the person who is the, the voice of the product. Uh, that's, you know, human, human nature, I suppose. It's, it's a case of branding. Um, I, 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 do, I do want to say one thing, though, with the, with the whole DAO mechanism. It's we, another, another problem which we, we haven't mentioned as well is that the whole issue around, because we, we're all looking towards this democratization and the, the public good giving people a voice but you do, you do have a bit of a problem when you're looking at sort of issuance and the fact that you know somebody can you know no matter how which way you do it whether you say okay well you need to pay a very small amount of my token to cast a vote but everyone says equal you still got that issue where when you remove that central authority and you remove a link to somebody's identity and they're their um, ability to, to vote, you, you have, you, you open it up to, to vote a fraud, um, which is, is another really, really big thing that needs to be dealt with and spoken about mm -hmm. with DAOs, because it's all right to have these talking points where it's just, oh, this is great, everybody's going to have a say, but there's, a, there's still a long, long, long way to go until, until this can actually work in society. Can I just pick up the point on the, the sort of hierarchy and psychopaths thing of conventional organizations? I think it's a really interesting point of, and that's because of these hierarchical power structures, right? So there's, in order to climb this pyramid that is implicit in general organizational design, most, most, most organizations are just a very overt pyramid with a power structure. And the way you get to the top is by fighting your way to the top. Yes. And that's why it tends to, um, aggregate to the very aggressive Machiavellian characters that do it. Now, they are basically unavoidable. If you think that your organization or DAO doesn't have a hierarchy, you're deluding yourself. It's there. Mm -hmm. And if you don't say it's there, you can fall to what's called the tyranny of structurelessness, which is when the people with power, it's, it's obvious that I have more power in, the, in our DAO than others. Mm -hmm. Most of the ideas that have come up with it are, are generated from the co-founders. So there's obviously an asymmetry in power. It's just there's an attitudinal difference in DAOs where this hierarchy that exists is climbable by everyone. Mm -hmm. And that every tier of the hierarchy is, in fact, the lowest tier of the hierarchy is the most important, the token holders. Everyone above it is answerable to them. So it, it's like flipped power it flips structure. The almost. Yeah. And Fighting your way to the top just means you've got more work to do and you don't necessarily get more joy out of it it's all, or even financial gain. The person coming in just, you know, filling the bags up and sitting and watch it happen is probably going to make the most money. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of an inverted power structure in a way. And I think it's, it's much of what the down movement is about is, is just doing something different to what's out there already. Um, so instead of the psychopaths winning, it's not psychopaths. <laughs> right. Well, who is going to, you alluded to, what are the rules? We are essentially on the edge of building DAOs, and we're making it up as we go along, many of us. And so who is actually going to write that rule book for the future? In, let's say, five years, let's say we have some kind of template for building a DAO. Who has created that template? I, I think one of the things to consider is the tools that are being used within the DAO. So this is where the work Nick is doing comes, becomes very important. And if the tools are structured in a way where you're actually rewarding participants, not in the traditional manner, um, then you start to really define you know, where, where this thing can go. And I think, um, when you, when you speak about who's gonna write the rule book, I think the, the people who are creating these platforms for DAOs to be governed on, the tools that are then being utilized uh, by these DAOs, and then of course, uh, people like us who are, who are really you know, building these DAOs. So I, I think that's gonna be sort of the template that emerges 
from this? I suppose it's the, the user base as well. So, you know, people are ultimately um, putting their money where they, they see best fit. Um, and ultimately, people will flock to projects with a DAO where it, where is, it works. is working and mm -hmm. is democratic. Um, even if it's not completely democratic, at least in some way, they're having a say over the technology that they use. And prior, prior to that, that was not the case. Yeah. Um, so empirical trial and error, whatever works will rise to the top. Is that what you think? I, I think so. I think there's, there's, I mean, we're doing it now. So we're, we're negotiating what all this stuff is. So we're, we're in this kind of dialogic phase where we're just trying to figure it all out. And the people like everyone on this panel who's living this and trying to build them are essentially writing the book. And it, will, it, and it is this provable out in the market as well. I mean, demonstrably, the most successful DAO at the moment is Olympus DAO, mm. which is basically a naked Ponzi. Mm -hmm. And so at the market, at the, market at the moment, the most successful DAO is Ponzi schemes. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that won't end up the case, you know, but it, the, I consider the market as a very, you know, we're at the kind of adolescent stage of the crypto space where everyone loves dog tokens and Ponzi schemes. And eventually the market will mature mm -hmm. and the, the stuff with like stronger fundamentals and more interesting use cases, you know, the utilities and the kind of that, that stuff will will rise up and maybe it's bear markets that makes that flips around the the sort of game a little bit. So eventually the market will decide what the winners are and essentially determine what the book is written at the end of it. I think. Right. Um, my own experience with DAOs, I was COO of Shapeshift for, before the pandemic. And um, Shapeshift has been a, a centralized company for many years, one of the OGs in the, in the space and exchanges. And Shapeshift recently announced that it was moving from a centralized organization to a decentralized organization, a DAO. What are, so do you have comments on the difference between setting up a DAO from the beginning with the intention of being decentralized and creating a centralized organization and then taking it to a DAO. What are the differences there? I, I think um, pretty much every structure starts off somewhat centralized, as, as you alluded to, because you start off you know, with, with a team of co-founders and you have this intention to set up a DAO. That does allow you to sort of transition quicker because you, you put in systems in place for decision making and that sort of becomes uh, the rule book. When you're going from a centralized structure to a DAO, um, usually people who are working in operations or in management, they have a lot of resistance to the new sort of way of doing things. And um, you know, it is different because sometimes dis decisions can take up to weeks mm -hmm. um, versus centralized structure, structures where someone like Nick or Ben could just say, this is what we're doing. So I think it's a, it's a learned behavior um, that, uh, that is difficult for centralized uh, organizations to. I, you know. I feel like it's gonna be extremely rare because obviously if you look at traditional um, you know, big corporates, let's say, people have established power in these organizations. There's also um, shareholders who are ultimately the, the owners of the company. They want a huge say over that decision making, but also the people embedded within the company climb the ranks like you were talking earlier. They're, they're not going to go for it. They're not going to, it's, it's, it's going to be a case where you've got new, um, new sort of companies providing infrastructure who have somewhat started off um, with a DAO mechanism, for example, like a polka dot where people are actually making decisions around the budget for a rebrand of the company and you know having some type of weighted voting on, on which logo and which color scheme to pick and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't think you're gonna get a traditional corporate that's gonna go out there and, and ask their shareholders or even, even, even more so ask their customer base and their users how much, how much money should we allocate to this new 
marketing project or this new feature in our application, it's, it's, it's very unlikely. I think it's going to be a, a whole brand new series of, of technology companies at least. I think you're saying human nature works against it because if you have power, you don't want to give it up. Yeah, ex exactly, yeah. Um, Especially if you're someone who's, who is a, a psychopath and, this, and is you know, working in the C-suite of some big corporate. Yes, it goes against the grain. And I think there may be a, a, a challenge from a regulatory perspective as well, because uh, one of the advantages of a decentralized organization is that uh, there's no one throat to choke for the regulators. Um, but in a, in a centralized organization, those, those directors are identified. They're always going to be associated. Even if the DAO does something down the road, Who's it going to fall on? It's going to fall on the original directors. So I'm not sure that's practical. That's why you should liquidate your company. That's why you should what? Liquidate your company. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, uh, there's, there's two things that come to mind around can, can a DAO impact a centralized organization? I think the first one is the ENS airdrop that maybe most people here might have heard of. But that, is, that was a centralized company that was building a Web3 piece of infrastructure, right? That basically of overnight democratized their governance via a DAO. Mm -hmm. um, and if you participated in that centralized company before, you were therefore privy to some tokens which gives you rights to participate in, within the DAO. So that, that, that's a super interesting way to look at maybe how DAOs can be formed from centralized companies in Web3. I think when you look at, yeah, as you say, there's a conflict of interest between uh, people wanting to retain power in centralized, in, in kind of typical enterprise maybe. Uh, but if you, if you started the DAO, which was maybe you know, a subdivision or innovation arm, and it had participation from the employees, you don't have to tokenize it maybe, but you know, it might open up different people to step forward and share ideas. That's an um, interesting idea. Yeah, um, which is just, just where else my brain went in. But I think the third thing that I thought of there was uh, around charities. And uh, I, I did some research into this, and actually charities I can't remember the name of the, it was a Christian church charity, but they, they were huge on DAOs in like 2016, 17. They saw these decentralized constructs within the church and within religion, and was just like, yeah, they, 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 they were super like down the rabbit hole as such. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you apply that ethos to maybe donations into charities and how a DAO could you know, effectively see that donation very transparently govern the direction of a project, mm -hmm. I think that's quite interesting as well. Yeah. Interesting. All right, I, I want to do one more question and then we'll do a quick round of final comments. But um, I think we've talked about what the future of DAOs looks like already. That was one of the, the things we were going to talk about. Well, we've kind of covered that. What does the present look like? How many DAOs are out there? How many people are actually doing this and being successful? I, I think right now we're at a stage where DAOs are gaining uh, steam, you know, we see hundreds of DAOs come up literally every day, and there's different uh, ways they're born. Some come from centralized structures, others do use new mechanisms like fair launches. Um, so I, I think we're at a, at a point in time where we're really sort of defining uh, the DAO structure and how it correlates to the area that it's focused on. So a DeFi DAO would be very different to something like a, a social uh, good focused DAO. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think we're in, in a place where now we're starting to distinguish how these structures will be optimized for each of these areas. I think I, I did attempt to calculate this not long ago. And it's not that many, I don't think, sustainable. Like say, there's hundreds popping up, their early ideas, the ones that are sustainably around. There's some tracking sites that estimate at about five to six hundred um, there's what this you know if, if you're talking if a threshold of a, above a million dollar treasury or above a half a million dollar treasury I think it's about a thousand there isn't many and this is the very there's going to be a thousand a day at some point mm -hmm. um, and you it, it will get to the point where you have no idea it's just coordination happening in in the same way that there's people setting up whatsapp groups and, and subreddits on Reddit. It'll just, it'll just bloom on the internet in a way that will be impossible to, to track, really. Um, so the, the present day is that it's, it's very, very, very early. 
no one knows what they're doing at all. <laughs> um, and like I said, we're, we're just building the tools. And the reason why we turned into a kind of DAO tooling platform is because there was no options. We just built it because we had to. Mm -hmm. um, because there was no, no options available. So I'm just very, very convinced we're right at the very, very, very start of a, of a long exponential curve. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that, you know, everyone's saying it's the year of the Dow next year, and it might be. Um, but I thought that was going to be the case for the last three or four years. It's going to happen. Um, so we're, we're on the kind of flat slope of the exponential at the moment, and it's going to go pop at some point. And it could happen any time from like December to 2025 or 2030 even, I don't know, but it's, it's still very early. I I, uh, one of our speakers uh, yesterday was from Matisse, and so I, was, uh, I know that company. They're also building tools for um, helping people to create DAOs. They're essentially, I think, DAO as a service almost. Um, I hope I'm not misquoting their, their, uh, their business um, objectives, but it sounds like there are some companies, a few companies like yours and Matisse, that are building tools to help help DAOs achieve the potential that they could achieve in the future. I think it's happening now, sure. I think Nick touched on something, and you, you said it earlier as well when you were talking about bear markets will potentially see the, the successful DAOs you know, continue to operate. I think treasury management within DAOs is something that is probably going to emerge as a bigger topic. And, uh, you know, if you're if the treasury is diversified, you're not necessarily, you know, you've got a, a sustainable view to where the DAO is heading. I think over a longer period of time, that will set you up to be able to you know, maintain building what you're building and ultimately ride any market pressures that might arise in that time frame. We're actually dealing with that right now. I, so yeah. <laughs> on point. Yeah. Um, I, I think another thing to consider is the launch of all these incentive programs from uh, layer one and various layer two infrastructure projects. You know, uh, just to give a few examples, Near announced $800 million for, for their ecosystem. Yeah. Binance announced a billion. I mean, a lot of this money is not going to centralized projects. A lot of them uh, are supporting DAOs within their ecosystem. Uh, and so I think it will further accelerate uh, this, uh, this movement that we're seeing. Thank you. Um, I'd like to do just a quick round. Um, something that you'd like to leave the audience with when they're thinking about DAOs um, over the next year or so. What is the one thing that you want to leave everyone with to think about? Start start uh, I, my takeout would be if you are passionate about what the DAO is doing and want to contribute, feel free to look, step forward and, and take some action from what you think or see, rather than sort of just rank on Discord, maybe. Get That's involved. Possible way. Get involved, yeah, get involved. It's transparent and un autonomous for a reason, so, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Ben. It's a big question. I was just stuck with this one. I, I, I guess I want people to just try it out. Um, get involved, join a DAO. Our sort of tagline is build a DAO, join a DAO, change the world. Um, and we've got t-shirts out there, go and get one that says DAO job is greater than day job. Um, so I think side gig in a DAO, get involved. Um, you will see a cultural revolution happen live if you do. Get involved, it's super interesting. Just try it out is my message. I'm inspired. I think for, for me, it's a, it's a bit of a, a warning from like a retail investment point of view. I mean, it's, it's you know, obviously great when you see the label DAO on a, on a project, um, but, but ultimately ensure that the project that, you, that, that is running and operating as a DAO actually has something tangible behind it. Don't invest in something for the, for the sake of, um, you know, they, they call themselves a DAO, ask yourself, okay, but they're a DAO and what are they giving me decision-making power over here? Am I deciding on how a piece of tech works that I think is going to be relevant and successful in the world? Or am I having a say in some infrastructure layer? Um, or are they just, you know, the next hype project in crypto like we've seen a lot with this sort of NFT art where it's not actually stored on the ledger itself, but it's stored off the chain. And it, you know, it's, it's, 
there, there's a lot of hype that goes around within the within the sort of blockchain community um, and there's a lot of marketing social media stuff and I, I really just give give a warning for people not to fall for that and obviously do seek out organizations that are runners runners a DAO it is good it is ethical and it's it's democratic but at the same time don't just buy something because it has the DAO label attached to it and it probably it's probably just another copy paste um, project that's like Great. a thousand others. Great advice. Is there? I would say it's an opportunity for anyone that wants to drive a cause that's near and dear to them. So I would say um, look at what's happening in this space, find a cause that's important to you, and be the change you want to see. Nice. Be the change you want to see. And let's give a big hand to my amazing panelists today. Thank you. Thank you so much.